As our kids go out, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Kyle Jones. Yeah, you can start coming on up. If you, if you don't know Kyle, uh, this was the first conversation I had with him last summer. Uh, Kyle and I go a little bit back. We, we knew each other before this conversation, but we ran into each other at Pete's and Pete's Coffee and Tea. Uh, and I was just asking him what he was up to. And he said that he and his wife had just moved back into town. Uh, they, had they had finished uh, Bible school and they were ready to start church planning not ready. They were wanting to church plant, that that was the plan down the road. And as we started talking, uh, it, his excitement got me excited. And it was just fun to get to begin to have conversations about what it, what does it mean to do ministry together and life together. And so this is one of the things that we hope to do as a church is to raise up young leaders uh, in the church who will be leaders in the church. And so this is Kyle's first chance to open the scripture on behalf of a community. And so we're, we're thankful for what God is doing in your life, man. So Thanks, man. Thank you. it's all you. All right. How you guys doing? Good? Cool. Well, uh, so Curtis did introduce me, um, but I did kind of want to introduce myself to some of you guys because, you know, we've been here for since like August or so, um, and we've met some of you and we've ate with some of you guys and uh, been able to hang out a lot, but some of you guys, we just know each other's names or, you know, we really haven't uh, gotten to know each other all that well, or maybe you don't even know my name. So, like Curtis said, my name is Kyle, and my wife is Lindsay Jones. And uh, when we were in Michigan, uh, where we went to Bible school, uh, we were praying that when we arrived back here in my hometown, that we'd be able to find a church that loved us and wanted to invest in us. And uh, that has been you guys. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's really an honor to be able to share what I've been studying in Genesis uh, today. Or, I didn't study it today. It wasn't like 15 minutes before, you know, put it together or whatever. But, uh, but it's, uh, I'm excited to share with you guys what I've been studying. And, um, and with that, like I said, you know, me and Lindsay, we are, we are married, and, uh, but we don't have any kids. And occasionally, we'll see a baby around here. You know, like, like one of you guys says, your, your firstborn baby or your secondborn, and they are just looking really adorable. And uh, we got to hold John Wesley last week, and uh, he's just got these big old cheeks, you know, and he's just this good-looking baby. And when we get to hold these babies, we go through this, this thing that is just, I don't know, it's like an epidemic, and it runs through, you know, everything we're talking about, and, uh, and we, we call it baby fever. And if you're a young couple who doesn't have kids, you might, you might have uh, mentioned this. Um, but baby fever kind of comes to an end when we start talking about like, well, okay, you know, you have to clean up their nose when they're snotting or when they spit up, you have to wipe their mouth and don't even get us started on poop, you know. You always got to change their diaper. Parents have to meet babies where their babies are at. And as we, as we go through Genesis, we see God doing this with... Um, people like Abraham and Isaac and especially Jacob, uh, people who have messed up and are dealing with the trials that come along with their, dealing with the trials that come along with those, those consequences of their sin and uh, just different things like that. And like I said, Jacob is, Jacob is no exception. Uh, Jacob was a deceiver. He cheated his brother out of his blessing and his birthright. He lied to his father, and he conspired with his mother. Um, as, a re as a result of his elaborate schemes to uh, get the birthright, he was uh, suggested by Isaac to move east. And, you know, Esau was kind of uh, upset, you know, maybe wanting to uh, get back at Jacob, and he was suggested to move east uh, to Padam Ram, uh, as, as I think it's pronounced. I, I like sharp A's, not soft A's, you know, so, so you know. But anyway, so he suggested to go there, and uh, so he, he heads out east, and he decides to stop in a city called Luz, L-U-Z. Uh, it's a hard one to spell, but, you know, it gets renamed. Don't worry, everyone. But anyway, 
So Jacob, Jacob takes, uh, uh, takes a nap. Uh, not a nap, I guess. I guess he'd be sleeping for the night. And he uh, uses his rock as his headpiece, as they put it. And he uh, falls asleep. So he uses it as his pillow. Um, but a really cool thing happens at this point, And that's that Jacob meets God. It's really neat. It's, it's this dream, and, and uh, there's been songs written about it, but it's called Jacob's Ladder. Have you guys heard about this dream? Um, and there's like these angels coming up and down, and, and then God speaks to Jacob, and he makes Jacob three promises. The first promise, you will become a nation, and your offspring will be given this land. Now, he's talking about Bethel. He's talking about Israel. The second the entire, the entire world would be blessed by your family. So he's going to have a big family. They're going to they're gonna return back to this land, and the entire world is going to be blessed by them. And the third and final one, I will be with you. God will be with him. And that's a really important one. Uh, so in these promises, Jacob rece- in these promises that Jacob has received from God, uh, God is basically, is basically announcing to Jacob that, you know, Jacob, despite your, your sinfulness, despite your, uh, the consequences and the trials that are coming from your sinfulness, I, I'm going to work out my promises despite those things. Um, so, for Jacob, this was, this was immensely encouraging. I mean, it wasn't like super encouraging, but I mean, he met God, right? Like, this is a big deal. Um, and, and especially since God didn't rebuke him. Jacob, Jacob, like I said, and I've been pounding into your ears, you know, he's, been, he's just come from this place of sin, and he's pretty much been emancipated from his family. And uh, so this is really encouraging for him. There's no rebuke from God. Uh, so it was probably the best dream ever, like I said. And, uh, and so Jacob wakes up and he does this. And I'll read it in chapter 28. That's where we'll be today. Um, we'll be in a lot of different chapters. But this one is where we're going to start. Uh, chapter 28, 20. That's where we're going to begin. So he says, if, or since, some translations say since, if God will be with, will, if God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread and eat, bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone, his pillow, which I have set as I that I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So Jacob made a pillar out of his pillow, and, uh, and, and it was affirmed by God that Jacob would be provided for. So he, um, so he headed out east. Um, and that's where, that's where we end up in chapter 29. Um, chapter 29 through uh, 31 is really what we're going to be looking at the, the most today. Um, and, and Jacob, like I said, he... Uh, Man, he had just met God, just been emancipated from his family, has so much on his mind. He was super stoked to find these two shepherds when he, arrived, when he arrives in Aram. Now, I don't think he knew he arrived in Aram. Uh, I think he just met these shepherds and kind of got talking to them and realized, you know, oh, dang, this guy knows Laban, you know. Um, and, uh, and, so part of Isaac's, uh, I might have left this out, so bear with me here. But um, part of Isaac's instruction uh, after being sent out to Aram, Padam Aram, was to uh, find Laban and marry one of his daughters. So, I mean, not a bad task, you know, if they're pretty, who knows? We'll see. Um, but uh, so he was looking for Laban. So talking to these shepherds, he was pretty stoked to be able to find uh, Laban. And uh, he's kind of getting talking to him. And then they point out Rachel. And they're like, oh, hey, that's Rachel. That's Laban's daughter. So then Jacob approaches Rachel and says, dude, I'm your cousin. You know, this is cool. And uh, so Rachel's like, 
Well, because, you know, family is really important in those days. And it's important now, but for them, this was like a big deal. So Rachel goes and tells Laban, and, uh, and Laban is, is seemingly excited to see Jacob. And he invites him into their, into their home, their inner circle, and things like that. Um, so Jacob spends a month there. Uh, he's working, and, uh, and finally Laban approaches him after this month, and he says, because you are my kinsman, because you're my nephew, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Name your price, pretty much, is what he's saying. Now, Jacob names his price, but we kind of got to understand why he jumps at this price so quick. So if you guys are in your Bibles and you look at verse 9, uh, I just kind of want to highlight this verse. And um, I did put a note here to make sure to tell you guys, you know, I might be putting something into the text here, but it's, it's pretty interesting to see when Jacob is talking to the, uh, when Jacob's talking to the shepherds, it says, he says this, or he doesn't say this, but this is what happened. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her, with her father's sheep and she was a shepherdess. While he was still speaking with them, while he was still speaking with them. It's almost like Jacob saw Rachel and he looked. And it was love at first sight. All of a sudden, everything stopped, you know. The sheep stopped moving, you know. You know when you guys fall in love for the first time, time stops, right? It happens. So anyway, so yeah, so, uh, so he has a thing for Rachel, obviously. Um, so anyway, so he jumps at this. He names his price. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. We're in verse 16. Uh, the name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak. But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, Ra- Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give you that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few because of the love he had for her. Jacob jumped at this chance. You know, working for Rachel made it worth, worthwhile for Jacob. He worked seven years, and it says it was only, it seemed like only a few days. And for, for him, it was like every day that he worked, I mean, seven days, I don't even, seven years, I don't even know how many days that is, but for every day he worked, he was investing a little bit, investing a little bit, hoping to get that payout of Rachel. However, what Jacob didn't know was that Laban kind of had his fingers crossed with this whole making a deal thing. Oh, yeah, sure, you can have my daughter Rachel, no big deal. Um, he, uh, he actually kind of... Um, kind of wrongs Jacob here. So, um, so, seven years are complete. Jacob approaches Laban, and he says, what I wouldn't say to my own father-in-law, give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. Now, obviously, you guys know what this means. Yeah, I don't need to explain it, but if you need it explained, I'm sure uh, Robert would be happy to do so. Uh, but anyway, so Laban seemingly wanting to, you know, give his part of the bargain. He, uh, he sets up what they would usually do for a wedding. He puts together this giant party and he puts together this feast. So he's got this feast going and stuff. And and what are you guys thinking of? Are you thinking of turkey and things like that? Well, it's not because feast, the word feast can actually be translated to drinking feast. So they're going to get smashed. They're going to be drinking alcohol like crazy, which is important. You know, you might think it was inappropriate for me to highlight that, but it's extremely appropriate because this this is what Laban wants. Laban wants Jacob to be getting drunk because this is what happens next in verse 22 of 29. Uh, So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. A drinking feast. But in the evening, 
he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you've done to me? Did I not serve with, serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? He got, the, he got the wife with the weak eyes. Bummer. So, um, so like I said, getting Jacob drunk was setting the stage to pull the switcheroo, basically. Uh, and and it, it seems kind of hard to understand. And, and it's kind of funny. We, went, we actually went through this story when we were doing children's church for the week of, um, of chapter... Of chapter 29. Uh, and, and we didn't highlight any of this stuff, don't worry. But, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking, oh man, it's, it's so weird that, you know, we sat in Sunday school for so long and we heard this story regularly, but we never, we never realized what was, what was going on there. How do you know he wasn't marrying? That's weird. But he was drunk. And, and the truth is, is the way they did this back in the day, was there was a marriage chamber. So there's this closed off room, right? And it was pretty dark. And also Leah, or who he thought was Rachel, she was veiled. So like a wedding veil. She would have been hidden. So he had no idea. He woke up and he was pretty bummed out. So, so they make a deal. Um, Okay, so they make a deal, and, um, and Jacob is just so confused. Um, but finally, Laban kind of shares with him the details of the plan that he didn't share before. And that was, look, in our country, we, uh, we don't give the younger without giving the older first. And uh, so, you know, so seemingly dodging the lie that he told that Laban told, uh, Jacob, Jacob made another deal with them, saying, you know what? As long as I can have Rachel, can I have Rachel and then work another seven years? So he does. He gets another seven years. And um, uh, so we start here in uh, verse 30 of 29. So Jacob went into Rachel also and loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Another seven years. Now, if you guys remember the first seven years, it went by pretty quick, right? You know, he's investing, investing, hoping for the payout of getting Rachel, and then, and then he doesn't get Rachel. And then he gets Rachel a week later, but he has to work another seven years. The sad thing is, is this is probably like a debt for him. And the Bible says, or... This chapter says that, um, that the first weeks went quick, but they don't really say anything about the next, or the first years go pretty quick, but they don't really say much about the next seven years. Um, so I'd imagine they went pretty slow. Um, he got his reward already. Uh, so, so he's now paying the debt. Um, and as for Leah and Rachel, you know, Time's passed since the wedding feast, and you know they're they're well into marriage, and um, and uh, they're having some issues. Uh, they're married to the same guy. They're sister wives. It's Real Housewives of Param or Am or Padam or Am, whatever you know. But uh, and uh, and they're just going at each other at each other's throats in competition. Rachel, who was barren, wanted children. She can have kids. And Leah, who is fruitful, just wanted her husband's love, which we read here. He loves Rachel more, but Rachel's not having any kids. So, uh, so a- after so long, Leah would give birth to four sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, and then Judah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So... So after Judah, Leah stopped having children. As for Rachel, she can have any children. All right, so envy and strife toward her sister in 
in her helplessness, Rachel approached Jacob and said, okay, so Rachel at this point is really bummed out. Um, you know, she can't have any children, and uh, Leah's having all the kids. What the heck, you know? And uh, so she, she's got this burden on her back. So she, re- she uh, approaches Jacob, and she says, in, in Genesis 30, we're in 30 now, <coughs> 31, uh, give me children or I shall die. Can you believe that? Give me children or I shall die. I imagine Rachel being a little bit dramatic here. And it's unclear whether she means like, you know, give me children or I'm going to pass away or I'm going to become a raisin or, or whether she means like, give me children or I'm going to kill myself. I don't know. I, I almost wonder if she uses her life and uses lo- uh, Jacob's love almost as, and takes a hostage here. But Jacob responds harshly and he says, Am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? Hello, do I look like God? It's God that has done this to you. And this is true. <coughs> so Rachel does something that's all too familiar. If, I'm sure you guys remember the, uh, the Abraham story um, where, where, I guess we'd call him Abram, where, uh, where they're promised a son and uh, Sarah is like, dude, there's no way I'm having a kid. So she offers her servant Hagar. So what Rachel does here in the way, way future is she pulls one out of her playbook and she uh, offers her servant Bilhah. And Bilhah conceives and gives birth to Dan with Jacob, and, and she also gives birth to Naphtali, which will actually be the future name of Derek's son. Uh, I know this. All right, so Rachel is stoked at this point, and in response says, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. So she She is the mother on behalf of her servant's children. And in her eyes, in this competition, she has prevailed. She has prevailed over her sister. The competition was on. Leah had noticed she wasn't bearing any more children. And in almost response to to Rachel's uh, taking the play out of Sarai's playbook, she does the same thing. So she gives Jacob, her servant, Zilpah, and Zilpah gives birth to, uh, oh, okay, Zilpah gives birth to Gad and then to Asher. Both sisters perceive their relationships as in competition. You can see that easily here, but, uh, but they were, but they were both losing, and this was because that Although they, they observed themselves in one competition, they were in fact in two different competitions. One who was, who was wanting Jacob's love, and the other who was just wanting to be the mother of Jacob's children. They were both losing, and they treated Jacob like a pawn in their scheme. Now, in chapter 30, 14... Uh, In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. So this is an interesting thing about these mandrakes. Uh, We don't really know why she wanted the, we know why. Uh, But it's kind of a question that pops up in her mind why she would want the mandrakes so bad. And what it was, was these mandrakes were an aphrodisiac. Um, they were uh, something that Rachel might have thought would, uh, if she was to have them, uh, she would be able to bear children. Obviously, this isn't a sure, you know, a sure safe method for becoming a mother, and I, I wouldn't try it if you guys are thinking of it. And, and if not, I could give you plenty of reasons why changing diapers is not a good idea, you know. But anyway, so yeah, uh, we continue through 15 and 18. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said. Then 
he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come into me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Isaacar. So that's kind of weird, right? So she, she's like, oh yeah, you know, so maybe I can get some mandrakes and then uh, Jacob, you know, oh, let's make a deal. So they make a deal with Jacob, totally proving this idea that, yeah, Jacob's just a pawn in their scheme, totally being messed with. Uh, <clears throat> God once again opened Leah's womb. She gave birth to Isaacar and then to Zebulun. She also gave birth to a daughter whose name was Dinah. So that's a nice change of pace. You know, having all these sons and then Dinah. That's kind of cool. I wonder what she was like. Uh, so Leah was finished bearing children. So a deal was made and Jacob was the price. Uh, it, it seems in chapter 30, we see uh, Jacob kind of becoming a secondary character. You know, he's kind of like, kind of getting bullied around a little bit by his wives, which is, uh, you know, you didn't think happened until the 20th century. Uh, but, um, but yeah, he almost becomes a secondary character. And, and seemingly, uh, Leah and Rachel both become main characters in the story. But, if we look closer, we can see that the real main character is God, right? Classic Sunday school answer. It's God, obviously. But as we read it, we see God's the one who's opening the wombs, you know, and he's allowing these women to bear children. Um, ultimately, fulfilling a promise that he made to Jacob. So uh, let's come back to 30, 22. Um, then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. This is a big one. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So, like I said, God's fulfilled his promises through him and he's worked it out according to his will. Um, Rachel's womb was closed up until this point, and then she gives birth to Joseph. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, at this point, Jacob's family has grown quite a bit. I mean, can you count all the kids on your fingers? I don't know. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of them. So, late, so Jacob, his, his entire life has changed from the point that he's walked in from from the beginning. You know, he was by himself. He just had that dream where he met God. You know, things have really changed for him. Uh, he had this family now. He had two wives and two concubines. He was doing really good for himself. I mean, come on now. Uh, but anyway, uh, so having a large family, he approached Laban, uh, and uh, he tries to make a and he gives us two weeks' notice. So, Genesis 30, 25 through 34. Send me away, that I may go to my own home and country. Give me, give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages, and I will give it. Again, Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you, and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it was increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything if you will do this one thing for me. I will again pasture your flock and keep it. 
let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled spot speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats and they shall be my wages so my honesty uh, so my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and and black among the lambs I found with me shall be counted stolen Laban, Laban said good let it be as you said Deal. Let it be as you said. We've heard this before from Laban, haven't we? Uh, And so Jacob makes his third business deal with Laban, naively so. Um, Jacob had worked for Laban for the past 20 years. Um, And what Laban did next was true to his character as a businessman. Uh, Totally conniving. So in 35, and I got the whole scripture right here. I'm not going to... What was it? All right, so verse 35 of 30. Uh, but that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. So Laban goes into the flock, takes all the lambs and the goats and things like that that are going to be Jacob's, and he takes them away and puts, you know, about one, two, three days journey away from him and Jacob. This way, when Jacob goes through the flock, Jacob won't be able to, uh, Jacob's options will be scarce. So (coughs) Jacob is... uh, Yet again, he's done wrong. Uh, so Laban took all the spotted sheep, and, he, and when Jacob came to grab his goats, he would have a small selection, like I said. Um, it, it's unclear whether Jacob knew Laban did this or not, but uh, Jacob's reaction here is, is really a sign of, of his growth. He, he stays true to the deal that they set. And you know, this isn't the same Jacob we've seen in, in, verse, in, uh, in chapter 27 or even in the beginning of chapter 28. This is a growing Jacob. Um, so he stays true to, to his deal. He encourages the uh, goats to mate and he takes the offspring um, according to their deal. Um, and I don't know if you guys got hung up on this at all uh, during the first few weeks of... Uh, of the small group where they talked about the, the poplar branches and kind of like peeling them back. Raise your hand if you guys talked about that in your small group. Let's see a raise of hands. Okay, yeah. Well, you're in my small group. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. So yeah, so this is weird. Uh, talking to Curtis a little bit before this, um, you know, he'd mentioned it would be good to, to kind of talk about that. Because um, as you read through the chapter, you find out that what Jacob does here is he uh, peels these branches off a tree and he throws them into water troughs so like these goats and lambs could, could drink out of them. And then apparently to mate and have uh, animals that are, the, that are spotted and speckled, which he could take for himself. Um, so obviously, this is probably just some superstition. Uh, similar to the mandrakes, where uh, Rachel probably thought that, uh, probably thought that they could um, get her pregnant. So anyway, Jacob's wealth had clearly grown, and uh, a shift had taken place now. And God had uh, approached Jacob, and he says, you know, Jacob, you should probably return home now. So he decides to do so. Uh, he talks to Rachel and he talks to Leah, and uh, they both agree that they should go. Um, and uh, so what Jacob does is kind of kind of bad. Uh, he he leaves uh, without telling Laban. Uh, so like quitting on the spot, basically. Um, and as soon as Laban found out, he uh, he pursued Jacob. It happened three days later. He as soon as he found out, he went to go pursue Jacob. And when he had finally caught up with him, God approached Laban and told him how to handle Jacob and how to deal with their, deal with their, uh, 
deal with their conflict um, and how to do it right. So Laban, Laban does it accordingly, and they're able to reconcile. Um, and then we'll just start in, in chapter 2 just a little bit. Um, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahainaim. And God had brought Jacob back just as he had promised. So God had made Jacob three promises in that dream uh, in, in chapter 28. The first promise was, Your offspring will become a nation, and you'll return to the land of your fathers. And, and we know that that's true. He had tons of kids, and in 32, we see him return back to the land. Um, and the second all the earth would be blessed by your family. We know uh, at this point that, you know, absolutely we've been blessed by his family. The Messiah came from his family. But we can see in, in, a, in the smaller scope of things that Laban's family was blessed through his family, his new family. And one, I will always be with you. He was always with Jacob, and we saw that. He was always with Leah and Rachel. He was even with Laban, directing Laban for, um, for the benefit of Jacob there. Um, so Jacob had created a mess for himself with all these things. His life in Aram was, was kind of a mess, and, and uh, you know, his wives had kind of created a little mess, and his relationship with his father-in-law slash uncle slash employer uh, was uh, kind of a mess. His whole family was kind of a mess. But God was faithful to change that diaper, right? He was absolutely faithful to change that diaper. And God, con- and, and God continued to work out his promises despite uh, Jacob's shortcomings. So Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The story of Jacob is not so much a story about the man Jacob, but more the story about our God interacting with the man Jacob. And in the broader, in the broader, in the broader scheme of things, how God interacts with us. Uh, Paul says this, and this is how we can apply it. Um, in Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That's us. That's us. Um, I put down some promises that we can, that we can, uh, that we can be looking forward to. And, and it, we can't expect the same promises that, that Jacob has. And sometimes we can get confused depending on, on where we're at. You know, a nation isn't going to come from our seed. We're not going to have two wives, two concubines, and a billion kids, right? We're just going to be, uh, we have so much more. Our promises are future sanctification, and God is and God is working that out in us, and and there is an end to that race, and uh, and we will arrive there, and and we will res- have our fellowship restored with God, and those are the promises that we can that we can rest in, like Jacob rested in the promises that he was given to him by God in um, the city of Luz, which he renamed Bethel. Um, so we can rest in that hope. And, uh, and we don't have to get bogged down by these trials. Uh, these trials that we go through as a result of our sin or uh, as a result of some screwed up family problems or whatever. But we can look forward to what lies ahead. Um, and uh, hopefully that encourages you, but also hopefully that challenges you too because if, if we don't have that perspective, then we're not living trusting God. And uh, maybe it seems just like a, uh, like a, like a privilege, but it's, it's really not just a privilege, it's, it's asked of us. So um, that's all I have for you guys, and I don't know how long I went, I didn't even look at the clock once. Sorry. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks, Kyle. Kyle, I commend you for picking one of the hardest passages in Genesis. And 
right? If you've read this passage, if you're familiar with it, it is insane. It is a crazy passage. And, and yet when we think about everything that happens in it, the, the rivalry, the deceit, the lying, the greed, the envy, all of these things, we're like, this is, this is the world we sort of know, right? But it's, it takes us off guard when we find it in the Bible, because we often think the Bible should be more spiritual than that. Uh, and so we are reminded as we come to this, uh, to this passage, as Kyle has confirmed for us, what does it mean to trust in a God who calls us to follow him faithfully in the midst of, of a messy world that would choose its own ways in the world? And, and, and we come to the table this morning, uh, and we come to it every week to be reminded that God is calling us to trust him and to trust his ways, that in the midst of a messy world, God would send his own son into the world to die for us, to offer himself to, to forgive our sins, uh, but also to fill us with his spirit, to transform us, that we might begin to walk in a newness of life, that we might actually begin to walk in the ways that God intends for us.